Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, Ian. Thank you, Lars, for putting this together. I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation that is going to follow my remarks. Uh, the title of my remarks is uh, Should uh, Reproducibility Be Part of the Undergraduate Curriculum? And I'm going to answer in the positive, of course. And I'm going to put forward some ideas for developing some foundational skills in this area. This work that I'm presenting today, that I'm talking about, is work done in collaboration with uh, Alejandro de la Chiesa um, from the University of Kentucky. So I want to acknowledge his contribution. And as I say that, I want to uh, be clear that these are just my opinions and do not represent the opinions uh, or the position of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, the Federal the Market Committee, or anybody across the Federal Reserve System. So, the answer, the answer, as I uh, already uh, revealed, I, I believe that yes, we should uh, teach uh, reproducibility as part of the undergraduate curriculum. And um, the reason to do this, and just to um, cut to the chase, is that this is a valuable professional skill. It's not an academic scientific skill necessarily, it's a professional skill. We should do this teaching throughout the curriculum we should not limit it to specifically a course in statistics or econometrics. We should start by uh, citing the data sources every time we make an argument um, using data. And we should do it by, we should teach this by leading by example. So our students will do as they see us. To expand a little bit more, so our students understand why we need to cite uh, the data properly. A good data citation shows the background work that went into doing, uh, putting a research argument together. So the research will be much more thorough and the, and the graduate student will come across as more reliable. It allows, a good data citation allows us to track the data sets, which is the first step to be able to replicate uh, research. So where does the literature in economic education and library science stand on uh, data citations and uh, data literacy? So this is a very foundational data literacy skill and the literature in economic education that puts forward examples on teaching and learning with data always argues for um, searching for the data, naming the data, and library science, the librarians have been working on this foundational skill of uh, citations and references for a long time. So specifically, in the next slide will show you that whereas in economic education we'll be working out of the arguments of Hansen to develop expected proficiencies in economic education among undergraduate students, and as librarians have identified seven standalone competencies related to working with data in a business context, since 2019, we have a very solid connection between those two, thanks to the statement of the American Economic Association that drives, directs researchers to cite all the sources of their data. So that's where the theory is. What empirical evidence do we have about how this is being done in the classroom? So I'm gonna share with you one uh, visual out of this uh, paper on uh, baseline competencies and student self-efficacy in data literacy. So this next slide shows you how 900 students from uh, coming from colleges and universities and 450 high school students are able to address, are able to answer seven pre-test questions related to data literacy competencies defined by the library profession. This is a slide. Shows you that high school students and college students have exactly the same level of proficiency when it comes to addressing data literacy skills, but college students are way more confident in their skills than high school students. 
So that means that we have a lot. It's okay. We'll record this. We'll do recordings. <laughs> that is, that's the beauty of. Uh, Somebody in the audience didn't like what you were saying. Did you still work? Okay. Now, that's just a very uh, at a very high level. Uh, my colleague Alejandro and I we've done some more work uh, trying to uh, address or trying to uh, uh, survey the skills that the baseline skills that the students have about. Uh, reproducibility. Can the students name, uh, can identify the data used in an economic argument? Can they uh, recognize the sources? Can uh, identify what a complete data citation uh, is? So to do that, we uh, uh, design a sort assignment with three parts. We give the students some uh, foundational instruction on what a data citation in economics could look like. We get them to practice those skills, bringing two different um, short economic letters. And then we gave them an opportunity to reflect and to identify uh, references and compare the citations between essays. So what is it that we found? We use the page ones, uh, one of the page ones that, that are primers that we produce at the research division at the College of Banco San Luis. We uh, use those two, uh, next slide please, two economic synopsis, less than 2000 words, just a visual, a graph, no equations, uh, no regressions, so an argument based on a data visualization. And uh, we, get, we got, um, this is what we found. We started with uh, 854 students with 77% uh, uh, willing to participate. Of those, 80%, um, about 80% were started the assignment, and 97 of those completed the assignment. So we got pretty good, uh, pretty good participation. The makeup of the students that we were asking, these are not your introductory students. These are the students that have at least um, one and a half um, economic courses under their belt. They have taken, um, they're not novices to statistics, so they have some statistics uh, courses with them, um, above uh, B uh, GPA, most of them business majors, uh, and your standard uh, distribution, uh, gender distribution and minority distribution in terms of their uh, sociodemographic profile. So what we found from these students is that um, about half of them can identify the series correctly in, uh, in an economic, uh, in those two economic uh, letters. The, a very small proportion of them can identify the sources correctly. So even though they might be aware that the series have to do with the consumer price index as one of the essays says, good luck um, trying to find where, that, uh, where those series are in any of the sources and a very small proportion are able to uh, identify an incomplete uh, citation. Um, a note, you can get a negative score in this assignment because we calculate the difference between the number of correct answers and number of incorrect answers uh, when calculating the, uh, the score that we reported there. We also uh, look into the misconceptions and mistakes that they made. Uh, we noticed that um, we learned that um, although very few can identify the resources, the, excuse me, the sources of the data, uh, many of them confuse the source with the distributor, um, which is a problem particularly for us at the Fellowship Bank of St. Louis because we want to be perceived and we want to come across as trustworthy distributors of data, but we don't want to be seen as the source of the data. Um, finally, um, you see there uh, the proportion also less than 50% of the students who consider that the citations uh, were complete. So where does this thing put us? Where does this thing take us? So the implications for instruction and curriculum um, are the following. Uh, enroll the help of the librarians. They've been working on this space for a long time. They're your allies. Um, be consistent when naming the sources of the data that, uh, that you use. And embed that practice in all your teaching. 
if this is not a micro skill or a macro skill or an econometrics skill. Every time we make an argument, every time we show a graph, every time we use data, we name the data, we name the source, and we should be leading by example. Last but not least, I just want to remind you, all of you in the room and uh, online, that citing the data is a foundational skill uh, and it can be practiced and it should be practiced across the curriculum. That's the end. Let me actually take a prerogative here. Can I get that training on data citations as a self-guided module for uh, senior authors of AA uh, articles? <laughs> because I don't actually think that the proportions getting it right are going to be drastically different. Don't make me talk. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's, I think, the key part of live that curriculum um, is that it's not intrinsic to how econ economics has been taught in the past, um, probably not how it's being taught now. And that's what we're conveying to students. So um, my guess is that that's pretty much what we get at the AA as well. Just two weeks ago, we had a workshop at the bank with 30 journalists and we were showing them how to use thread to tell the stories behind the data. And uh, one of the journalists asked me, you know, what's the biggest peeve that you have? You, know, you can get asked to do one thing. Uh, what's the biggest thing to fix? And I said, just please give credit to the sources as they deserve it. So. If you find a Fred graph, congratulations. But spend some time reading below, below the canvas when it says source and name the source. Fred is not the source. Uh, you're not helping your readers if you're not telling them what agency is putting that set together. Quick questions from the audience. We'll have time at the end to discuss too. Okay, so Lars, thanks very much for organizing this. I'm very happy to be here. and. Uh, hear other people's views, get to share mine, and hope it leads to more discussion afterwards. Uh, so the title of this whole panel is Should Teaching Reproducibility Be Part of Undergraduate Education Curriculum? And I'll give you a spoiler alert. I, I think the answer is yes. And uh, I'll tell you why and, and have a few perspectives on it. So, so in fact, <clears throat> I'm going to build this up, but the punchline is going to be that really it shouldn't just be part of the curriculum. It should be thoroughly integrated from the beginning and through the middle and to the very end. That basically every time students are working with statistical data, they should be making documentation for what they do and turning in with their projects. So if it's just uh, in your very first intro stats class where you have to do a t-test to see if mean compensation for women is the same as men. So what do people do now? They go to the computer, they type t-test, men versus women, they get some results, maybe they copy and paste them, put them in their paper, print it out, and turn it in. And what I would advocate is doing all of those things and writing a little script that says, open the data file, do a t-test, possibly save the output from the t-test. And then that do file gets turned in electronically at the same time that a piece of paper gets turned in. And if it's a slightly more involved uh, kind of project, then, then you know maybe at some point you want to say, hey, put that script in one folder and put the date in a different folder. And maybe have a folder for your output. And gradually, as assignments get more complex, uh, the structure of what students have to create in turn gets, gets more complex. As people start doing research, they've got to start putting in data citations, have to have some kind of guide the data sources that gives all those data citations, uh, a nice readme file, but all this can like be built up piece by piece as uh, as students go along through the curriculum, and and so it shouldn't be a special topic, it shouldn't be like a special half credit course on reproducibility, uh, and it should just be the routine way things are done, so that someday people don't even have to talk about it, just like. Nobody talks about putting bibliography at the end of the paper. Uh, they should be doing this without, without talking about it. So that, that's my view. And, and in economics and across the social sciences, and I'll a comment about undergraduate curriculum. Uh, I, I think that in getting this stuff into the undergraduate curriculum, economics has been slower than some other fields. 
I, I think maybe possibly political science has been most uh, progressive about this. I think economics as everybody Economics has got the gold standard for journal editing and, and documenting professional studies. But I think in the curricular area, uh, we have a little bit of catching up to do. And, but, but really, even across disciplines, it's still quite a small fraction that are doing this in a, in a careful way. Okay, so, so I want to tell you a bit like how I, why do I think it should be so ubiquitous? What's the purpose of it? And does it really make sense in principle? And then the last bit about how can we get there, I don't really know. I've got some ideas and it, it's going to take collaboration among a lot of stakeholders, so to speak. Uh, but I think we're at a moment where that could happen effectively. Uh, but so that's kind of speculative about the future. Okay, so, <clears throat> so why, why do I think it's such a good idea? It's based on my own experience. So I'm not a data scientist or computer guy or anything. I was just teaching an introductory statistics course for economics majors in which they wrote research papers. So working little teams for the whole semester, they choose a topic, review some literature, find some data from some real source, and then do intro stats course. So simple, mainly just descriptive statistics, bar graphs and stuff to try to get some idea about some issue they chose. And for my first few years of doing this, it was a great idea, but I really could not understand what they were saying in their papers, what they were saying about what they did with their data. They would talk about merging these data sets and there were no possible variables that could have linked in any way between the data sets. And, and worst part was when I would ask them about it, they did not know. And why is that? They were so they were they were all using Stata and they were typing commands, but just interactively. And and so one day walking across campus, I said to myself, ah, problem solved. Have them turn in their data files and some do files, their do files, and then problem solved. I'll just see what they did. And that did not solve the problem because what they turned in was bits and random scraps of bits of do files that didn't run and the data wasn't there. And so slowly over several years, uh, I figured out what kind of structure they needed to be able to put together a whole package that had everything it needed, that everything would run. And, and after five or six years of experimenting, students now do this with close to 100% success rate, like there are issues with the papers they turn in, but I can, I can run them and see what they did. And, and let me tell you what, what the benefits came from that is, because so the, the, immediate, the immediate goal was that I could understand what they did. And that works because now they turn in stuff that I can see step-by-step step exactly what they did. I understand it and in fact, they understand it better. They can, they can talk much more intelligently. They can interpret their results much more intelligently because they know, they know what they did. Uh, <clears throat> the middle point about dramatic enhancement of ability to advise and evaluate student projects. So a key key thing is that they keep all their stuff up on a file sharing platform. And you can use the one you like, GitHub or OSF or Google Drive or Box, whatever. And when they come to see me, first thing I do is I go and I download all their stuff onto my computer. And if they have some question about why some regression dropping some variable, I won't look at it until I've opened their first do file and work through it bit by bit and see exactly what they've done. Then we get to the problem. And the fact is we never get to the problem they're asking about because something comes up before it, we straighten that out and then the later problem is solved. So, when I look back to what I used to do before that, when they would just print out a regression where some variables drop and ask me what happened, I would try to think, what can I do to get this student to leave my office without looking really flagrantly negligent? And uh, so this, this is an improvement over that situation. Uh, and students catch on quickly. And uh, so that, 
kind of communication is really, really the big thing. And, and the bottom thing is like it reinforces core lessons about intellectual integrity that particularly for undergraduate education, I think are a big part of what it's about. So just learning that I can't just say something and justify it by waving my arms. I've got to make a careful argument based on evidence and carefully looking at my evidence and understand how all the pieces really fit together. Uh, and that's when I can make some kind of claim. So, you know, in the old days, you know, frankly, I didn't understand what they were writing. They knew I didn't understand what they were writing and, and they'd all get B pluses and A minuses and life went on, but that's like a bad message to send them. So, so I think, these are like pedagogical benefits that I think are special to undergraduate education uh, that I think get less attention. But if we're talking about undergraduate education, I think they're actually really fundamental. If you go to the next slide. So these are also very professional, very important things. But I think these are the things that are more commonly recognized that, you know, work and reproducibility, that's a necessary condition for doing credible research. So if you're teaching research skills, you better teach them to do it. Uh, and relatedly, it's becoming an essential professional skill among researchers. And even for students who don't want to go into research careers, they're going to be RAs or analysts when they graduate from college. These kinds of skills are really, really helpful to them. So, so those are benefits. So, so it was in 2013. So I, I was doing all this closely. I collaborated with my colleague, Norm Medeiros at Haverford. And in 2013, we started calling a project here. We've been doing faculty development workshops and those are the main things we've been doing. And, and we have had a lot of success of a certain kind. We, we've had a lot of success at connecting with individual faculty members and helping them figure out ways to do things in their classes that in, or incorporate this reproducibility. I mean, that sort of our, our sort of paradigm way of working with people is they come to these workshops, they've been teaching some quantitative methods course, have various assignments, but it's all done point and click or just interactively. They're, they know they should do something different, but don't quite know what to do. And this just helps them get over that hurdle. And, and uh, so, and, and that's been our main, Say target audiences, instructors. And if we count up, we'd probably find something in the hundreds of instructors who have started doing this, which for me and Norm, just kind of putting out messages saying, come to this workshop, uh, we're fairly happy about that. But now I've been doing this for 10 years and it's working out and we've learned a lot about it. And so we're now really at an inflection point where we think we should step it up a bit. And, and a big piece of what makes us think this should be broadcast more widely is we've discovered like how flexible this whole idea is. So if you look at the tier protocol online, it's very bossy. It says put these folders exactly here and call them exactly this. And the reason for that is not because we care exactly about those things, it's that students don't know. So for people with experience, you can say, okay, organize your folders in some reasonable way, uh, but students don't know what you're talking about. So just to make it concrete, we give them like specific guidance, but then, then we're very explicit about, but then if you've got reasons to change that, do it the way that works for you and use whatever kind of software you want, uh, use whatever file sharing platform you want. And you can do this in a whole range of exercises. So the whole tier protocol is written as for like a senior thesis or a complete research paper, but it can be scaled down to smaller exercises. I was talking about like your very first introductory homework problem. Uh, it can work with that. So there's huge flexibility. So, and so it's like applicable at all different you know, there, there's some core principles, uh, but they can be applied very flexibly in a lot of situations. So, 
So the, we would like to find a way to go beyond just individual faculty members and get a little more critical mass going. And we would love to see departmental coordination so that students don't just get this randomly in one class and then forget about it, but it's what they do all along. Uh, so, we, we would, and we would like to get more people involved. We would like to get more. So we'd like to get more people involved in writing curriculum. Uh, so far, we most everything we have posted is stuff that we've written, and that doesn't scale very well. Uh, so, and, and the thing is. If people do this in their classes, then they can take what they've done in their homework problems or exercises, and we could put that up on the tier website. So, so that's the framework we're right now is how to how to scale up and get greater involvement beyond just individual faculty members. And so, I hope some of you will be interested, and we'll hear from you or have opportunities to talk. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Um, uh, it's great. And I definitely want to dig into some of these topics. But first, first, we have to hear from Mars. <laughs> so I see he sits up. There's a question, a burning question from the audience. Well, I sit up. Yeah. OK, yeah, yeah. Completely burning. Um, so how much time do you spend in class showing best practices about how to actually organize, organize your files and, and, and that sort of thing? Is that, is that something that's still, still as a, a research I'm, I'm still trying to figure, figure out, out and it's constantly evolving as well. In, in, so, so like how much time do I spend explaining to these students? So, so like you, you take time, time within, within a class, class setting, setting to say, say, hey, hey this, this is how I organize. organize. This is how it works for me. Maybe start here so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and then kind of make little perturbations to see what works for you. Yeah, so uh, that's what we sort of spent five or six years. It took like five or six years to kind of come up with a general scheme. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Project Tier website, projecttier.org, and look at the Tier Protocol 4.0, that's like a template of all these folders and what goes in them and how they're organized. and what's in a readme file and and so that's sort of the starting place mm -hmm. and actually because that's posted now i don't have to spend that much time okay. I, I say set up these set up these folders and read up read on the website, website what goes in a readme file and how these two files work uh so so that's the, i think uh one of the main things we've done is, is give, give people a template to start with and then tweak this as okay. they like. So please have a look and please let, get in touch if you have questions. Okay, um, let's see. Well, I did feel duty bound to, to, to tease Lars. Um, I am looking forward to his comments. Lars and I have, have frequently uh, discussed, let me get my screen sharing going, uh, frequently discussed um, trying to expand reproducibility uh, at federal agencies, especially when it comes to working with restricted data. Um, and so something we've talked about a lot is how to incorporate students, both undergraduate and graduate as sort of embedded interns inside the organizations to, to facilitate some of that work. And so I think Lars is, well, I know Lars is about to talk about this. So um, yeah, well, Lars, let's, let's hear it. Okay, so um, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for joining as well. Um, and I think what, I'll be talking here piggybacks nicely on top of what you guys laid the groundwork for, um, because one of the things uh, that you mentioned is that this is actually of really excellent use in later professional life. One of the realizations in actually running, and you know, if you want to just move forward the slides, one of the things that um, I realized when running the AA replication lab is that um, many of the skills that Richard had pointed out before are not present in my student work body that I work with. And so I actually need to train them up on those skills at 
at least to the level that they can verify, not necessarily actively produce what is needed to do there. So they need to recognize data citations. It's one of the very first things that we do in the sort of intensive one-day training uh, stuff, et cetera. Um, so training undergraduates in this is, is the ultimate goal, right? Um, how that occurs in my particular case happens not in a class, but in an RA work on campus, but that's introducing them to what they might be doing afterwards. Uh, next slide. So um, the background is that the work that we accumulate um, in, in my lab for all the eight journals of the AEA um, is doing this at scale. So I train uh, normally around 15 or 20 students per uh, every four months to come into my lab to help me with this. There's normal transition of folks in and out of this, but um, a good chunk of them actually stay until they graduate. So this is a long-term engagement with them. It's more than just a class in which this appears, which if, it, if reproducibility techniques appeared in every class would be a similar type of engagement, right? Um, yeah, next slide. <clears throat> so the basic idea is that we start with what Diego laid out. We have to first figure out where in a replication package data comes from, right? And so figuring that out, what are they actually naming? Where do they get the data from? How do others get at the data is core part of this. But then the rest of it, assuming that you somehow got access to the data means that you're actually going to be running code, which hopefully is organized as Richard laid it out. Many times it's not, uh, but trying to figure out what that other person thought that the next person running this was going to do is the key part that all of these RAs are essentially the first reader of, right? And so over the course of doing this, they repeat repeat, repeat. Uh, there's actually enormous uh, learning going on here. They uh, scale up relatively quickly. Over the course of a year, uh, the um, 40 students who at some point in time in the year are in my lab helped me uh, review about 450 articles, okay? Um, but one of the key things that happens is that when we can't get access to the data, we can do some sort of uh, we can look at it, it's plausible that it works, but we can't get it. Where is that kind of data is restricted access data where you need to apply for data. That could be because it needs to be purchased. It could be because you have to have a data use agreement with the New York state or something like that. Or it could be data that is confidential data in the FSRDC or other federal agencies. Okay. And we have interacted with such entities on a regular basis where RAs say at the Federal Reserve have run code for us of authors that use data within the Federal Reserve data infrastructure, et cetera. Um, we've had staff at the BLS run code for us when we could not access it in a timely fashion, but we only scratched the surface in doing so. Okay, uh, Ian, forward. Um, so, by taking these undergraduates and giving them these skills, we actually think that we can also um, get at this data as well. Okay, the skills we're teaching them are going to be, um, as I lay out, practiced within an internship, which replicates what we do at the journal, but with a slightly different focus. Okay, and it teaches them important skills. This is not just about how do I organize my data, right? Um, it's about visualizing best practices of the 10 cases that you've seen over the course of the year, which ones went well, which ones did not. Um, communication skills. Uh, all of these students write uh, at the end of each paper a report that I review, right? But I only minorly edit these. They need to convey to me when something failed, I need to assess whether it's their problem or the author's problem, right? And we go back and forth and they improve those communication skills to me, but ultimately they're communicating up, right? they are writing a report which will be read by a Nobel laureate who submitted a paper, okay? And so how to do that in a way that remains objective, scientific, uh, evidence-based, um, where is the problem needs to be communicated uh, clearly. Okay, so they learn that. They learn what's called um, data acumen and data management curation skills. They need to find some of the data based on the description that's there, they need to organize it the way that the author said, they don't have to invent it on their own what they need to do, um, but they need to sort of do all of these. All of these are workflow and reproducibility skills that are being taught here that are valuable, I believe, in the professional context. And given the sort of um, anecdotal evidence I get back from, from my former RAs uh, are actually valuable. Okay, so they're useful in the graduate studies, they're useful in non-academic workplaces. 
What do students do to get a foot into the door for these non-academic workplaces is among other things, internships, okay? So how can we combine that into uh, a single scenario where we can uh, get them into scenarios where they can be RAs after graduation, gain some skills beforehand, gain some experience with what's their data acumen about these kinds of things, as well as give back to those places because getting somebody to uh, agree to host an intern comes with uh, challenges, financial obligations. Uh, most of the time, the thing that I encounter is it's a lot of work. So something needs to be given back and we've got some ideas on how to do that. Okay, um, I think we can skip over that. Uh, it, it helps in econ that we don't, we aren't particularly diverse in the methods that we use. 70% is Stata, uh, the rest is MATLAB, uh, and then there's a spattering of R and Python and whatever. It means they don't actually need to learn that many different skills, but they are going to be faced with different skills. So there will be the occasional Python or R program. So they also need to recognize when they can't actually do it because they don't have the right understanding of it. But the way that authors describe on how to run R or state or MATLAB differs as well. Certain styles of communicating how you think about that. There's certain ways of thinking that. Um, the worst, I must argue, are those who provide Fortran programs because they just dump them on you and assume you know what to do with them. And that happens to be the most diverse way of doing it because there's so many different compilers out there, but that's just on the aside. Okay, so um, we train them uh, on a variety of skills. Um, recognizing the data, as Diego mentioned, uh, the ability to describe the data once they found it. Uh, so recognize that you actually haven't found the same data is just as important. Tracing data, recognizing data access conditions. Diego has it easy. He just points them to a FRED website, right? Um, but to recognize that what these various data access conditions actually mean when they need to get access to them, that you might need to apply with a three-page proposal and a one-and-a-half-year security clearance process versus I need to sign up here and just provide my email and download it. There's a wide range between those two extremes. Um, that is something where they're not usually exposed to that as part of their undergraduate studies, but they are exposed to that here. And as an intern, they may also be inside and realize that now that access is, is different, but I might still need to be put on a project and, and participate in that and, and justify that. Okay. Uh, among my RAs, I, I tend to uh, pick one or two out that sort of do repeating uh, data access requests. So we use the IPMS API. We teach an RA on how to leverage that API. We use. We often get papers that use uh, demographic uh, DHS, uh, demographic household surveys. Um, name. I think the acronym has changed a few times. Uh, and you need to put in a request for the specific files in doing that. So we train students on these kinds of features. All of those are valuable in terms of um, then going forward into other uh, scenarios. Um, so we have lots of guidance. Um, I'm actually thinking that data and code guidance uh, about data citations. So I'm going to put the self-test for your uh, thing in there. Um, because that's where we try to disentangle. How do you actually cite data when you're told you actually, this is confidential data, et cetera. There's lots of examples in there. It's what we use to train the students. It's what I point authors to when they tell me I can't cite the data, et cetera. Uh, so the training is actually quite similar. Um, so debugging code, right? Um, after um, a number of runs, they learn that debugging code is, is, is not trivial. Uh, sometimes it's just babysitting programs because there might not be a main file and things matter in which order they are run. Uh, in other cases, we go back to what Richard said, something is failing, show me where it's failing. Uh, the software we tend to use is not super helpful with that either because an error in Stata might manifest itself 500 lines further on in a log file and figuring out that that actually needs to be traced back is something that they always stumble over at least the first time. Um, and so those are skills that they get from uh, this training as well. Um, so um, that ability to debug and to communicate that to others, whether it be their supervisor, in this case me, or to the authors, is something that, that comes out of this. Um, so, this, I just wanted to focus on that all that is then condensed into a report that summarizes that information. Sometimes it's not supposed to summarize because you need to get at where the error is actually happening, but so how to keep a report uh, reasonable while pointing to where, where other uh, things are 
is another one of those skills. We give them a lot of guidance on that. Uh, as Richard said, they might not know what that looks like, but we give them a template that they fill out and, and structure to do that. And again, they get better at this over time. Um, I already mentioned the communicate to uh, the ability to communicate up. Um, the um, these are sort of um, so some of the softer skills that they learn about this. The ability to sort of put it into objective language. Uh, one of the uh, things that I convey is that there isn't bad code. There is code that doesn't produce what's supposed to be produced. Um, that's one way of uh, sort of explaining in two different ways. And that is something that doesn't necessarily come naturally um, to, to, to students as well. Uh, but that's extremely important when you're working in a complex environment, such as a federal agency. Like that. Next one. So um, the opportunity is to bring all this together. We're doing this <clears throat> for a journal, but the basic idea is you have a project. It's been described in some fashion by their authors, and it has certain features, reproducible or not, uh, that adhere to it. Um, we are interested in, as a journal, from we can't get access to this data in an easy way, so why don't we just send a couple of students and next summer work down a list of doing these things um, um, and stockpile essentially those data. Um, many other journals don't even have the resources that the AA has here. So um, part of this could very well be and we've trialed some of this with, a, with graduate students as a pilot, where we just take a pile of papers published in a journal in the last year or two. And we've done this with the Canadian Journal of Economics and my co-organizer of the session, uh, Marie um, to, to do that for the Canadian Journal of Economics, where we just work through a pile of papers with the students that are there, um, <clears throat> take the time it takes, and do the feedback or the verification of reproducibility exposed. What happens when it fails? Well, there's a data editor in the room who can then go back to the authors and say, well, you actually committed to producing a reproducible uh, package, fix this, um, and then we'll have that public. So it might be of interest to other journals to do this as a bring in an intern who's been trained on these kinds of matters or bring in a bunch of interns, do it as an educational exercise, as a summer workshop, uh, et cetera. Could be called an internship because you might be interning at the journal, could be called a summer workshop to do this kind of stuff. Next one. Um, sorry, I've already said that. Um, so um, then taking this to um, uh, how this relates to the other activities, when they actually come back from such an exercise, um, they are typically not currently learning this um, in their coursework, even not in specific data science classes. Um, actually, I probably should have skipped this slide. Uh, why don't we just skip that? Um, so. How useful is this, right? So how useful could this be transferred into a professional environment? Um, I uh, get about the typical internet survey response rate, even when I survey my own former RAs, when I send them a survey link. Uh, so we, we tried this, uh, we got a few responses. Um, the responses we did get were generally positive, um, both in terms of the actual technical skills learned and of the mindset that was conveyed, which is what you were emphasizing, right? So the idea that you can actually have people think about this. The notion I get back from the students is that once they actually go out, especially into the non-academic world, the idea that they need to actually review somebody else's code before the firm or the agency or whatever sends it out is really important. Um, and that's not something that we typically teach them in our classwork. Um, so there is some scope here also to um, that we've, we've trialed in a course that we've taught before to sort of have some in-class peer review of code that was written as part of this exercise as well and to provide feedback on that. Um, um, that sociology a student, for instance, has worked for a nonprofit and, and um, her takeaway was this helped a lot in terms of documenting what they were doing um, and conveying it up, up the pay grade, right? Uh, next one. Oh, okay. Um, so translating this into an internship would mean um, sending the training students um, uh, through what I we currently use is probably transferable as a curriculum. It might need to be adapted uh, in terms of how to do this. Um, if it is for a federal agency, getting them security clearance. So you might want to do this in January, train them, and then get security clearance and in the summer when normal internships happen, uh, sending them into an agency to do this. Um, 
We can do this using articles that have been published. Uh, we can do this on projects that are being worked on at the agency by internal researchers or uh, federal researchers. This is actually done at some agencies, but it certainly is, at least from my impression, not standard practice in most agencies to do that kind of uh, review before it exits. Um, and so there's, there's various opportunities to apply these skills. And at the end of uh, the summer, the students uh, would very well have contributed to the agency, would have learned. Um, my guess is that over an intense summer, they could do five or six papers um, with a report that comes out of that, and then take that back into, say, their senior year at the university and apply it to work that they do there as well, with an eye on where they might be employed afterwards, whether that's graduate school or professional work. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the basic uh, gist of uh, transferring the training that comes out of a very specific purpose of, of a journal's perspective uh, and applying it to uh, a more general context, uh, like internships at data intensive agencies. I'll stop there. We had enough to do with AA journals. We had to go think about every federal agency making their stuff reproducible. <laughs> um, I don't actually, uh, so I think it lines up with um, the current focus on transparency as we go forward. Uh, the future National Secure Data Service uh, will need some sort of transparency and reproducibility. Uh, it goes forward with credibility. Um, when you can't publish the data, what kind of reliance do I have that you actually did the work properly in the first place? Um, and so conveying that there is a review process in place, I think is useful, but that review process can be, the RA will never uh, second guess your, your, the correctness of your code. And that is a, a key important part of, of going forward. But uh, they can certainly assess whether it actually runs in a reproducible manner so that somebody else can, can do that. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, from the work at, at the AA, I, I don't get a lot of feedback about how useful the reproducible archives are, uh, except anecdotally at some conferences. And one of my satisfying moments is when somebody said, this was something that I downloaded, I set aside three weeks so that I could work on making it reproducible and it worked within three hours, right? That's because we have done that pre-vetting into something that makes it feasible. And now you're three weeks into your research project that said, I, I, I don't believe that these assumptions are right. What happens when? We've accelerated the research process, right? And that is true for any of, of, any of the papers that might come out that are policy papers that should, you know, if they're, if they're putting something forward, they should at a minimum be reproducible. It still doesn't make them correct, but at least they're reproducible and it allows others to then to, to second guess those. Okay, uh, well, I, I do wanna take a moment, thanks Lars, to, to thank the panelists and then we'll turn over uh, to uh, some questions from, from the floor, um, but let's give a round of applause. For <laughs> okay, um, so uh, are there any questions from the floor? I guess I'm curious about implementing an undergraduate uh, program. So I'm curious about like what are the actual stumbling blocks that you have run into when you have um, tried to implement this at Haverford um, in terms of when you are actually speaking to other faculty members. Um, how, how has that worked? And so at, at Wake Forest, we just started teaching a exact thing you said probably isn't the best practice a one and a half hour course on reproducibility, which is essentially the course mm -hmm. that I'm teaching right now. Um, and so we're taking baby steps in that direction, but yeah. that, that seems like a ways off for, for our, so I'm curious to hear you talk about your experience with that. So it's sort of like one of the hurdles to overcome to make this happen. Yeah. So thinking of the traditional mindset we've had of like, what does an individual faculty member have to do to make this happen? Uh, <clears throat> It, it takes some startup costs, but it's really not as bad as you would think. So that, you know what, the, the place to start with is what you wanna do with your students and what you wanna teach them. And what kind of like, what kind of exercises have you been doing? And then 
you just say, okay, so then how can I build reproducibility on top of that? I think if you go like, for instance, like look at the tier protocol and say, how do I do this? It's not gonna be as effective as saying, okay, how can I wrap up this project I already had? And just what extra pieces would students have to do to make it reproducible? And, and now one common stumbling block is writing scripts. So the first few times we did faculty development workshops, we didn't say anything in the, in the information explicitly about writing scripts. And then like three of the people show up and like, oh, we have to use Excel. No, our department says we have to use Excel. And then we didn't really, didn't, they didn't get much out of the next two days. So we started making that clear in the information. So you gotta be writing scripts. And what, whether it's say to do files or SPSS or anything else. Uh, but then, then the short version is just everything they do. They write in, they write do files or scripts of some kind and save them and organize them. And, and you can, you can ratchet it up bit by bit kind of incrementally. Like uh, the sort of the full blown thing is to have like separate folders for everything and relative directory paths that save stuff where it's supposed to go and grab data from where it lives. But that have, doesn't have to be what the first time. And, and you know what? It's really not that hard. The biggest stumbling block is getting people just to spend a few days on it, thinking about it. And, and, uh, and, and part of what Project Here is about is helping people do that. So if there's any interest at Wake Forest or you want to get in touch, uh, we are happy to work on a custom basis to try to help you figure out what you want. I might add to that what I've found to be quite useful um, is to have a motivating example that leads into it. So you start with something that is easy. What we've done in the past is sort of say, okay, here's this thing we want you to compute for, uh, I don't know, uh, Tompkins County, right? Uh, that's where Cornell is located. So go find these three numbers for Tompkins County, compute the statistic. Okay, next week you go back and say, okay, you figured this thing out. Now we're going to do it for every county in the US. That is the introduction to they're not going to do it that week because now we need to go back and say, okay, what were the steps that you did? How can you start to make this reproducible 3,000 plus times? Because you don't want to spend the time doing that. You could, but you don't want to. Right? And then you get to, okay, now you've got these data sources. How do we download them, structure them? Where do you want to keep them? Uh, you might have a ton of output files. How, where do you, would you put them if you start to have a ton of output files, um, et cetera. So you build up from a single motivating example that then expands drastically. Um, and we found that to also be sort of the first time around, yeah, you did an Excel because you can, right? You can copy paste the number from the website into this. Second time around, well, we're gonna do 3000 times, maybe that doesn't work so well. Although somebody will come around and figure out how to do matrix manipulation in, in, in Excel. And as long as you can explain it to the next person, because then we add that peer review onto it, you're gonna exchange in class. And you're gonna to have to read how to do it and do it yourself as well. That's one way to sort of motivate it, which I, I find when I train those, those undergrads, we walk through examples simply because you're gonna see far more complex papers. We don't want you to stumble on when it's really complex. You need to decompose into simpler parts and then go from there. Um, that 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 I found helps a lot. So yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. So I'm currently teaching a three uh, part course, three series course uh, on data analytics and growing for um, specifically. What, what I find, uh, what I observe is that the students who are um, struggling marginally, probably historically underrepresented, uh, in particular, who don't have a lot of access or don't have any access to computing power, uh, but are interested in economics. They actually find those kind of guidelines in terms of what are the best practices, how you can do this stuff. The how to is very, very useful. That's a way to kind of pull in, pull them in, and also dissipate that anxiety um, that they have. Associated with you know more courses in general or data courses, but trying to convince the faculty um, and our folks basically to change the the two norms that you were asking us to basically change, which is full transparency in terms of your work, right, 
So whatever it is that we are producing or they're producing as followers as researchers, and then also full transparency in terms of how you do that yourself. So you can teach your students is a little bit, I find it that it's, it's not fair to ask of folks like us who do it, you know, for ourselves and for our students. I feel like there are gotta be some sort of institutional normative change at, at higher levels that would help all of us instead of just, you know, putting it on the shoulders of individual instructors who are willing to put it you know, our time and, and change the curriculum and go against the grain. I mean, I, I would put on my hat as data editor in the sense of if you are intent on publishing in the top part of the publication distribution, that is what you have to do. So you, don't, you can't get away with less than that. Um, there's an argument made by um, uh, Tim Salmon uh, in actually the first session of, of, of this webinar series that you really want to be the last journal not asking for reproducibility because what are the papers you're going to get? Um, so there, there, there probably can be, I don't know if it's necessarily so, uh, a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom in terms of transparency. And if you articulate it that way, um, I would say for instance, well, if you can point at your own papers because they're historically weren't within that paradigm because we have been shifting that paradigm. And go find some of the simpler articles, say in the Journal of Economic Perspectives or things like that, where there's like three tables in the paper or something like that. But they are all now also reproducible and transparent in their methods. And they might be simple and they might even include some Excel files, but they are a way to motivate why would you do it that way, right? And, and so it may not be your own work. Lots of our old work is not necessarily up to those standards. Um, because it wasn't scrutinized as heavily as it is today. But if you go out today, and I'm not just saying go to the AA journals, go to any number of, of, of the journals that have been doing this kind of vetting with the data editor and editor in charge of doing these kinds of things, uh, you will find papers of any desirable complexity to sort of take as examples for that. You might start with toy examples because that gets people into this easier um, and then progress to sort of saying, you know, there's sophisticated economic reasoning around these texts that's illustrated with a couple of graphs, and those graphs are made in a transparent way, in a way that you can reproduce them, for, for instance, by going back to uh, to Fred to sort of get at the data, etc. I don't think I have a problem convincing the students to do it, right, particularly PhD level students, because they, they know they need the skill, they need to learn it, and they typically don't actually get even specific guidance on how to do it. And if I'm talking to a uh, African American student who wants to go into the issue, she definitely doesn't have those skills because she also needs to put herself out there asking to, to be taught that. You yeah, know, yeah. Usually it's outside of the curriculum. So pulling that back into the curriculum, and that's, that's going back to, to the faculty who is teaching the course or to teach the right. courses and saying, can we please put that in? But that gets into their marginal you know, costs, yeah. and that's where you have the block. You know, I'm not willing to adopt it because I already have my syllabus. I mean, like Richard said, there is an initial cost in doing so, but it, 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 uh, you can probably speak to this more than I can do. But one of the things, things that, that you see in the literature is that that initial investment can actually open up other pedagogical capabilities. Right? So, for instance, I don't need to rerun your reproducible code. If it's truly reproducible, I can have. The, the system, system we run it right we're going to work through github education or some other platform etc people do this with dropbox folder something appears in the folder they sit the script on it and run it that actually makes your life as an instructor easier because now you can provide objective feedback you don't need to do this all on your own etc so it can enable new feedback mechanisms that actually accelerate the educational process right um, because you're not just lecturing, you're actually interactively developing these kinds of things. But that is an argument that has to be made, that has to be bought. Um, and it's, uh, there isn't a lot of empirical evidence, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that this works. So, and, and uh, yeah, and, but convincing people, that's hard. So that, I mean, that's, I'm glad you asked, and, and I hope that we'll talk afterwards, because this, I, I don't know the answer exactly, but somehow getting, these norms to shift. And, I, and you know, one, one promising thing is that in there are other disciplines to ally with, like 
in the American Statistical Association, in their education committee, there's some people who are very committed to this and would be happy to join in some efforts in political science and sociology. So, so like shifting the norms is an important thing. One, one, one paradox to think about is it would be nice to have some maybe top-down leadership in this thing. Instructors being told they have to do this, but but then I think I'm you know when the associate dean comes and says, "Here's how you have to do things," that's not a good way to start. So well, something, I, something that you said in your remarks just get me to think about you know, this idea that you know your students, my students, would do some hard to digest things with their data, and it would make no sense. But it's, as long as just what happens in the classroom stays in the classroom, we're not going to make any progress. These practices are able to connect what happens in the classroom, but things that are going to happen beyond the classroom. So just, I don't know where you're going to, where do you need the motivator for that change? I think it's a professional organization, like the American Economic Association, needs to communicate that to the professionals who educate, that this is not just, uh, it's a best practice, a best scientific practice. I don't know. Did the American Economic, the American Medical Association communicate to the merchant need to wash their hands before they operate? Did they, did they, was that a memo or was that something that everybody discovered individually? Um, so I think we should learn from that experience. I, I should add on, I don't think economics is unique in that challenge. I've observed, for instance, one of my kids has taken a couple of biostats courses. And of course, I had to sort of open my mouth and tell her that there's more reproducible way of doing our homework, which would save her work on the next homework. And uh, there was no credit given for reporting it back other than in a copy and paste in Word form uh, with very, very, very poor reproducibility. And when things failed, little in terms of support. So it's not unique to economics that there might be some reticence there. People are in their materials, the, the materials work, uh, they're, they're, they're doing them. One idea might be that even the process of a faculty member enhancing the current um, materials to be something more um, reproducible is itself a teaching exercise, right? So actually going through that work and detailing what are the steps to go from that without necessarily laying open that you weren't doing this or et cetera, depending on how open you are about these things, but just to sort of say, okay, here's the example. Now we're gonna take a detour around the sort of blockage that was there that wasn't reproducible and making it more reproducible. As I outlined earlier, there are steps you can take to sort of reverse engineer it into being some, something that's reproducible. That whole process itself is a teaching experience and that might be a way also to gain more acceptance of that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I fully agree with, uh, with your points that um, leading by example is pretty much the issue. So, so, we, so have we have to get the journals to request it, and we have to do it ourselves. But it's like, like always, get always to get to the problem. Do we have enough resources for that? So I myself published, published the journals, and they didn't ask for it, maybe because they don't have the resources. So do you have any solutions for the resource problem? I mean. Uh, should every, every journal have an internship program as you suggested or it, something else? Out. So I, I submitted, for example, two papers to your institutions uh, journals that I allow you, and I haven't submitted the code. So because I wasn't asked for it, and so I didn't have an incentive. Um. Um, I have a future conversation with the ILR review on this, um, but I, I, I don't have much to say about what, what they do. Uh, they actually, you did actually, when submitting to them, to, uh, commit to providing code if somebody actually asks for it. Um, so that might have been the fine print, but that's actually is in there. Uh, that's known not to work super well, but um, we'll see. Um, I mean, this goes a bit beyond where undergraduate education comes into play. I think part of it is a supply and demand thing that as it becomes easier to supply the reproducibility part, it'll become more natural to provide it in the first place. And um, one way to articulate, to switch a bit to the journal part, 
um, even if the journal doesn't require it, there are a lot of authors who provide it anyway, right? And so you might have a GitHub open out there and you might have archived your stuff. Part of what I did at the A was say, if you've actually done these steps ahead of time, you've actually say archive your replication package on Dataverse, on ICPSR, on Zenodo. I am actually, if it's fine, I'm not actually gonna move it. It's fine where it is, you've done your job, we're done, right? Um, generally, there needs to be a bit of improvement on the documentation, but that can be handled and things like that. So there need to be incentives to also facilitate it if you've actually done that. One of the things that I argue to graduate students, which also to some extent applies to undergraduate students, whether or not they're my kids or not, is that this actually saves you time in your other classes. And now it becomes a win-win situation, right? I've seen papers from clearly coming out of a thesis of a graduate student that were extraordinarily time intensive and really didn't need to be. And that is how you value your own time is one of the key factors here over which you have control. So just saying, okay, my, my thesis advisor asked me to do 30 different variations of this model and I'm gonna hand code all of them or I'm gonna script that, invest a bit into the scripting and then just push the button and do. And you want 300 of them? Sure, I can do that. Um, I think that's part of the equation as well is to get the students to understand this isn't just for external validity. This is also a time saver. Like reproducibility is a time saver. You messed up in that data cleaning step at the very start. Now you need to redo your whole exercise that's due tomorrow because you just found this in doing the last revision. If it's reproducible, it's a push button. Right? If not, if you're going to copy and paste this all back into Word, it's a lot of work. Good night. So that self-motivator in there is, I think, a key aspect that we can bring through the entire research stack all the way back to the undergraduates as well. But once it becomes more easy to do so, I mean, my one of my points on why I think this, this internship or, or practicum with journals might be of interest is because it reduces the cost. It turns what appears to be a cost into a positive exercise that both provides educational benefit to the students participating in it and provides a benefit to the institution, journal, agency, whatever that is, uh, going through that exercise with possibly a, oh my God, this isn't as reproducible as we thought it was. Um, but that's, that's the painfulness of transparency occasionally. But there's a win-win possibility there if you actually do that. So it doesn't actually require additional resources. Every journal is hosted somewhere. Some are commercially hosted. Some are hosted at institutions, right? Can you do this? Can you collaborate with institutions? And it allows, one of the side projects of the internship was to actually to particularly focus on URM students who might have otherwise difficulty in finding internships in agencies, et cetera, but who have otherwise the right skills to do so. Part of it is that in order to get them to that point, you might need to do some upskilling and this is an opportunity to provide targeted upskilling. How do you run Stata? Okay, your institution doesn't have Stata. Okay, let's do this in R, we can do that, right? Uh, you don't have a computer. Okay, you've got a Google book, we can do this in the cloud, right? There are tools to do all of this, and to get back to the curricular development, there are sample curricula out there that sort of embed some of these things, whether you take them wholesale or you just take pieces of that, um, that's the challenge. I don't know of a good resource for that. You would probably collect it more of them than not. So there are some examples and demos and exercises on the Cheer website and many more in the works that will be coming soon. Uh, Like another source of reproducibility, reproducibility oriented, ready to go exercises. I don't, I don't know. But what, what, one thing, an interesting exercise for an instructor to do is just take, take an existing exercise and say, okay, what do I have to build around this to make it reproducible? And what Lars was saying about being a time safer. It's the same it, it true it isn't teaching because uh, like once you've done it a few times, it's easier what you're teaching. And, and the big thing is that when students come to your office, you can help them in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time and actually resolve something, where, whereas they spend much less time just uh, uh, spinning their wheels and, and getting nowhere. All right. I'm not the one. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah, yeah, and the risk, risk is pissing people off. And what one thing you can do is just somehow make your students' work visible. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have an ally in the Hafford Library, where every student's senior thesis gets archived electronically, and he just started also posting their documentation with it. So and then you know some colleagues kind of noticed that and that there's a little bit of interest. So small thing. So the demonstration effect. I mean, one of the things is that I found when working with my RAs on these kinds of things, it takes me a lot less time to have them figure out the problem by telling them how they should document it so that I can look at it mm -hmm. because half of those cases, they then figure it out themselves. So it actually reduces my work as well, right? And they learn something from that. Uh, I've got time for for one last question, and I'll take the the moderator's prerogative to to, to ask one. Um, I, I wonder, you know, speaking about all of this, and uh, I was, you know, I think uh, some of Diego's observations early on that this is kind of something that doesn't necessarily need to be a curriculum, but that can be woven through the the curriculum. And in terms of getting buy in, it seems like textbook publishers in particular could be doing more to facilitate some of this, just at a simple level, you know, if you can start to take baby steps to get people thinking about data citation and data provenance. And, you know, when you get, not to call anyone out, but say you get Wooldridge's textbook and you get the, you know, our Wooldridge package, you have no idea where most of those data came from, you know, and it's, the usual prefabricated thing where all the data are already cleaned and you know you just know it's a data set with wages and gender or whatever um so i just wonder if any of you have thought about kind of the role of textbook, textbook publishers, publishers or i guess i mean the aa also does some of this dissemination but it's just in disseminating sort of more simple um these more sorts of simple things we, that, that don't require quite as much Build up that, that you know a uh, somebody who's already teaching econometrics or say labor economics class could then very easily start to kind of move more towards at least thinking about data citation. I think about it every day, and when I go to sleep. I dream of it. <laughs> and my dream is that one day, uh, textbooks, the same way that they have a chapter it's between a chapter and uh, the textbook that I used to use in my intro classes, between right after chapter one. They have to have an appendix on how to read diagrams. So how to plot in a two-dimensional diagram, how to read a table and what, what that's that. Why isn't there an appendix on working with data? Why isn't there an appendix on citing data, on acknowledging that data, so the headlines uh, indicators revise? Um, but to that point, I mean, I have also an evidence of publishers who don't want to use real data because Real data revises, so it's much more convenient. Well, to not if you use Alfred, <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's yeah, you know, it will be it will be sweet, uh, and one day it will happen. Um, maybe our grandchildren will see it. Uh, that where students is a foundational skill and is part of interactory textbook material. You're actually suggesting that that sample way here's a list of wages actually has its data source and it's cleaning to become that data file also exposed, right? For instance, that that is specifically what I'm describing. I mean, I'm yeah. teaching a class right now where I have to sort of go back and, and explain to students that every data set they've ever gotten is com completely fake, essentially, that's just designed for them to be able to use a complete data estimator on it without having to get their hands dirty. And that that's a very unrealistic way to, to view the world, A, and that B, they should understand where those data came from in the first place. Um, but it strikes me, you know, that's a lot of heavy lifting on my part. And so why, yeah, you know. Uh, I mean, there's a textbook in William Hacking from Arthur, who's a good friend of, uh, of Fred, uh, that has a companion website with all the series uh, reference, you know, all, all the, uh, you know, links to all the URL, all the, all the Fred data. Uh, but it's using the textbook, so yay. I mean, the other way to, uh, to think of it is you might want to publish a website that's an uh, unofficial addendum to a, a textbook that says, okay, here's the clean data set that comes with the textbook. 
here's one where we've actually downloaded some LNSY data. Here's the cleaning we've done for it. We're good. That's lesson 15, which we might not get to, but at least you sort of bring it forward to, and here's the same thing with some real data. And it might not actually reproduce because maybe all that clean data was, you know, not, not fully, fully compliant with that or things like that. You know, you may also be taking on a little more than you really have to in this context. I mean, I think there's a place for students just learning about how to do a technique and just having clean data that they do this with just, and you know, if they had to every single time go back to the micro data and get rid of the people who were in jail and everything else, then, uh, you know, that takes time and attention away from just learning techniques. So, so like the, I was the kind of stuff you're talking about building in is like valuable stuff in itself, maybe in an econometrics class, that might not be necessary. However, I would say the key thing to build in is whatever they do with it, they should make reproducible. So yeah. just as long as they're writing scripts for whatever exercises they do, we might have. Yeah. That, that yeah. to, to, to be clear, my, my particular class is explicitly focused on measurement after they've already had some some statistics and so yeah. part of the pedagogical purpose is yeah, to okay. kind of highlight yeah. this for them but yeah. yeah point point is absolutely taken um well unfortunately it seems like we're out of official sea time for this so uh, i want to give everybody a round of applause for participating uh, uh i guess look out for this to be posted sometime depending on video quality and join us for the next one. That too. <laughs>